Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman, and I thought I would do a behind the scenes video today about how I am using a piece of software called vMix to produce all of the video that you see here on the channel. That includes my live streams as well. My workflow for many years has been to basically record everything live to disk while I sit here. So I generally don't shoot separate B-roll. I just live switch here on the fly as I'm recording, and I found that my editing workflow is a lot faster and a lot more efficient if I'm walking in with everything pretty much edited at the time that I record the video. So I've been using live switching solutions for many years to do what I do. I started with an ATEM television studio, one of the precursors to the now popular ATEM mini hardware switcher. And I upgraded from the ATEMs to the TriCaster back in 2014. I bought a TriCaster Mini, which served me well for many years. So after six years of faithful service, I decided it was time to retire the TriCaster, just in case something happened to it. Six years of continuous use is a good long time for a technology product, and this kind of runs the show here, so if it went down, I'd be in trouble. So I was looking at upgrading. And I was looking at new TriCasters, but the new TriCaster Mini cost more than mine did back in 2014. And then it required additional equipment to bring in the cameras that I was using with my TriCaster on the new one. And it just got to the point where it just felt like it was getting too complex and too expensive. They were doing software updates on the one that I had that kept messing stuff up for me. And it was getting kind of frustrating, to be honest, uh, working with the TriCaster and not having those issues dealt with by tech support. So I started looking at alternatives, and vMix was something a lot of people were recommending to me. So I downloaded the trial version. I installed it on my gaming laptop. It's a Lenovo Y740 that I bought two years ago. And to my surprise, I could run the entire channel off the laptop exactly as I was doing on the TriCaster. And I decided last spring to build a new production machine myself, basically a mid-range gaming desktop. And it's been working great ever since, and I saved a ton of money. So what we're gonna do today is get vMix running on another gaming laptop, this one that Lenovo sent me a little while ago. And what we're doing with this is donating this to my local elementary school. So Lenovo's donating the computer. We actually got two of these, one for the high school and one for the elementary school. And I, in turn, will be donating a vMix license to both schools so they can get a legit copy of the software going as well. And what's fun is that both schools are currently doing some live production. The elementary school has a morning news show that's broadcast on campus, and the high school is doing a lot of sports and other types of things. And this will provide a lot more flexibility because they'll have a mobile production studio and they can bring in video over NDI, which they can't do currently. So I'm really excited to help them get going with this. Now today what we're gonna do is get vMix up and running on this laptop. And I'm going to build out exactly what I'm doing on the desktop computer so you can see how I'm using vMix. And I'm using a pretty simple approach to it, and I think it'll be helpful to give you kind of the foundations of how vMix works by replicating my workflow on here. And once you get the foundation down, uh, you really can start thinking about how to do more advanced things. And maybe we'll come back with uh, future videos and cover some more advanced topics. And of course, you can let me know uh, what some things are that you would like to see in the comments section. Now, although Lenovo is providing the computers for this project, this is not a sponsored video. I paid for my vMix licenses with my own funds. And there might be a few hardware devices that come into play throughout the course of this video that came in free of charge from the manufacturers, and I'll disclose those products as we're working our way through. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own, and no one has reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see how I am using vMix on this laptop. Now, the computer we have here on the desk is a Legion 5 from Lenovo with an i7-10750H CPU, a GTX 1660 Ti GPU, and 16 gigabytes of RAM. And this works really well for a basic 1080p production. I'll show you some ways you can monitor your performance while you're getting things set up. Now, vMix on their website has a reference system page where you can see what different configurations might look like. And this is kind of meeting their Sapphire requirement. Uh, this does not have Thunderbolt, so we're going to be doing all of our video capture with USB. And we're going to be using, for our example here, a, a cam link from Elgato. Now, in full disclosure, they sent this to the channel free of charge a while back, and we did a review on it. 
And what we're going to do is plug our camera into the HDMI and pop the USB into the USB port on the computer and it will bring in that HDMI video pretty well. I was running the channel off of this cam link. This was what I was running my camera off of for almost a month and it was working pretty much flawlessly. Now there are cheaper options out there. You can get these super low cost HDMI capture adapters. They all look somewhat the same and have the same guts inside but they're not as reliable. They tend to overheat sometimes and they tend to not keep the video in sync and it's not something you're going to notice necessarily but it does create issues and I found that the Elgato even though it costs a little bit more it's just going to give you better reliability and that's why you might want to look at something like this. Now in addition to these capture devices you can bring in USB webcams, you can use the camera that's built into your computer, there's a lot of different ways you can bring video sources in. Uh, vMix says that you can realistically get two or three cameras brought in via USB and we're going to talk about another method that I use using something called NDI video in a few minutes to get more sources in and this is all like convoluted right now but once we start plugging things in it'll make more sense. So let's begin here by just attaching our cam link and I'm also going to connect up uh, some HDMI that I have coming from a camcorder and we'll get that going. You'll see that light light up on there. And now that that's going, what I'm going to do is go over to the computer here and load up vMix to get uh, started here initially. And sometimes when you look at the screen for the first time, it's kind of daunting because you don't know what you're looking at. But basically what you've got here at the bottom are all of your inputs. And right now we don't have anything configured, so they're blank. And then you have a preview here, and then you have an output here. So everything on this big screen here on the right in green is what you're going to be recording or pushing out over your stream and vMix pretty much works through inputs and inputs can be anything and it handles those inputs the same way it's just the type of input is what you define initially so what we're going to do here is bring in a camera which is the camera that we have right now plugged into our cam link here and it will recognize the cam link I'll just pull down this menu here you can see cam link 4k that's the name of the device but we're using a 1080p uh, signal right now. I configured vMix to have a uh, 2997p uh, frame rate. That's basically 30p at 1080. And I'm just going to click OK. And boom. Let me just mute the mic here. And I'll talk to you about how you can get rid of that in a second. But that's it. We've got a input now, just like that. And now what I'm going to do is hook up another camera. Uh, this is the PTZ Optics webcam that we looked at a few weeks ago, and in full disclosure, this came in free of charge from PTZ Optics. What I like about this is that it's got a nice 1080p output signal, and I'm just going to plug this into the USB port on the other side here. And then what we're going to do is add that as our second source, and this is going to kind of replicate uh, the two camera setup that I'm running with right now. We've got one camera pointed at the desk and another camera pointed at me. So we've got the camera pointed at me right here on our example system. And now what I'm going to do is just add another camera. And we'll go back up to the camera interface here. Now that huddle cam is showing up. And again, it's defaulting to 1080p. And I'll give you the better view of it here. Uh, it's defaulting to 1080p at uh, 30 frames per second. We're going to click OK. And now we've got two cameras, just like that. And if we wanted to cut between them, in other words, have this camera go live and have this one go back to preview, I can just hit cut. I can also do a fade. I could merge the two, which if you have uh, something in use in two different places, it'll do a nice animated move. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Um, but that's it. Pretty much I have replicated my multi-camera setup here uh, just like that. Now, one thing you need to keep an eye on with vMix is the amount of system resources that are being consumed every time you add something new to the mix. Let me show you where to look for that. So what you want to do is keep an eye on this little strip here down at the bottom. I'll give you a better look at it here. Uh, this is going to give you a real-time look at your resource utilization. And what you want to make sure is that you've got a healthy margin across all of these different items here, the GPU memory, the CPU, and the total. Because if you get too close to 100%, you're going to see performance drop-offs and other issues coming into play here. Now, right now, with our two 1080p sources, we're barely scratching the surface as to what this laptop can do. But every time you bring in something new to your production, 
I would keep a close eye on the impact that that new thing did to that meter down there at the bottom because you'd be surprised sometimes bringing in a fourth or a fifth thing might be what tips you over the edge for some reason. So just keep an eye on that to make sure that you're not going to have a problem in the middle of your production. And one of the key things with vMix or any uh, live production software for that matter is to always test, test, test long before you go live with something that uh, might create an issue in the middle of your production. It's always good to be prepared. Let's take a look now at audio. All right, so right now we've got my webcam here as the active camera output, and we're also getting audio from the camera passing through as well. How do we know that we're getting audio? Well, take a look at the uh, little audio meter here next to the input number two. It is bouncing, and you can also see that the audio is green. Now, if you look at input one, you can see that we're getting audio from input one as well, but look at the color of the audio meter. It is turquoise, which means that it is not what is currently being broadcast out. And if I go ahead here and click cut, you're gonna see that the preview image here on the left will become the program image. So there we go. But look at the audio. Now the webcam is turquoise and the uh, video camera here with me on it is green and that's because right now every time I cut audio is following the active video output and we may not want that because when I record a video the audio that goes into this camera is always active so how do we make that happen here so what you do is you go into your gear icon here and that'll pull up the screen that you see right here I'm going to close in a little bit closer on it for you and right now, by default, vMix has automatically mix audio set to on. So what we're going to do is turn that off. And that's a big deal right there to turn that off because this will solve our problem immediately. Uh, so we're going to do that, close the window. And now I have to manually activate audio down here. And that'll light up green. And now when I cut back and forth, you can see that the audio light never goes off. And my audio levels here... Uh, stay green all the time, even as I switch back and forth. But uh, you may not want audio out of the other camera. So what we're going to do here is, again, repeat the process, turn automatically mix audio to off. And now with that off and I cut back and forth, you can see that the webcam's audio never goes live. But if I enabled it here, it would stay live all the time. Pretty simple stuff. Now you can also get at audio here on the side and this is where you can adjust levels. Uh, this is the one thing that a lot of people kind of complain about is how the interface works with the audio here. Uh, you can detach this window and put it on a second monitor or something and then you can adjust the levels manually for uh, each device here. We're not going to get into all the nitty gritty about audio in this video. There's a lot of depth to the audio feature on vMix. You can have multiple audio buses and all sorts of crazy stuff. But for a basic simple production like what I do, it's really easy to work with once you get the foundation of it. And if you've got that automatically mixed thing set to off, it's just a matter of clicking the audio on when you need it and clicking it off when you don't. Uh, what you can do is go into the settings here, and I'll give you a closer look here at the screen, uh, and go over to audio and disable this feature globally. So basically right now when I enable this feature, anytime I add a new input to vMix, it will never turn the audio on. And I can tell you this is a really safe thing to do, especially if you bring in inputs in the middle of your production, because sometimes they come in super loud and it'll blow your uh, audience's eardrums out. So leaving this off is a really safe way to go about it. So that way you can get the audio level set and then when you're ready, bring that audio up under your control. All right, the next thing we need to get going here are some keyboard shortcuts. And the reason is, is that I am doing everything while I am recording my videos. I am the director and the talent, and I control everything from one of these inexpensive Logitech wireless keyboards. I've got the cut command here mapped to the space bar. And when I hit the space bar, it switches my cameras. Isn't that cool? So it basically takes whatever's in preview and makes it program. And then I also programmed in some of the number keys here to get different cameras queued up into the preview section. But let's take a look at how we can set up one of those keyboard shortcuts, and then you can get an idea as to what shortcuts you might need. So what you want to do is look for that settings icon in the upper right-hand corner, the settings button, I should say. 
click on settings and I'll give you a closer look at this again. This is the same uh, settings screen we were in a second ago to set those global audio uh, settings, but we're going to go down to the, um, the shortcut section here and I'm going to click on add and I can pick my key from the long list of keys here or I could just click find and push the key that I want to use, which is the space bar and I'll click OK. And then we're going to go to function and what I'm going to select here off of function is something from the transition uh, option here. And on that list is cut. And that is what I want to use. Uh, the duration is basically one second. I could shorten that up or make it longer if I want. By default, it will uh, have it switch between preview, but you can basically have it switch between anything you want. But for simplicity, preview is what we want. And then I'm just going to click OK. And now it is ready. So if I click OK again, and now I hit the space bar, check it out. It moves things back and forth just like that. And I've got keyboard shortcuts set up for just about everything. So I can start and stop recording with the R key. I've got my cameras all linked up to number keys on the keyboard. So as I'm recording, I can feel my way around and queue up something in preview and then hit the space bar to take it live. Uh, so you'll spend a lot of time in that section getting things going there. Uh, next, I want to talk about recording. And you're going to find recording down here on the uh, lower left-hand section. You'll see a button here for record and then a gear next to it. And I would click that gear first to figure out exactly what type of file format you want to use. And I'm going to bring you in closer here so you can get a look at that. Uh, so for me, what I use is the vMix AVI. And the reason why I like this format is that it is a lossless format. It records basically whatever the vMix system is getting and processing. It doesn't take that much of the CPU to get that stuff recorded to disk, and it doesn't use any of your GPU's encoders, which you might need for streaming or something else. So I found this to be the most flexible format to work with. Uh, when you install vMix, they give you the option to install a codec for this, uh, which should make it easy to drop these video files into your favorite editing application on Windows. On the Mac, you do need to convert these to ProRes. And towards the end of the video, when we go through some of the more techy things, I will show you the ProRes converter that I use to bring these videos over to my Mac. But it's worked out really well for me. But you have other options here. You can select MP4 and just do a straight up MPEG-4 file. You can set the bit rate here. Uh, what I would always recommend you do, though, is enable the hardware encoder. And the reason why you want to use that hardware encoder is to preserve precious system resources, because if you are not using the hardware encoder, it's going to rely on the CPU. The NVIDIA GPU on this laptop and on many other consumer NVIDIA graphics cards gives you three of those encoders to work with, and I would suggest using them whenever you can. But again, I like to use the lossless uh, format here, which is not reliant on a hardware encoder, uh, nor is it very CPU intensive. And what I'm going to do here is just direct my recording to my C drive. So let's go over to C, and I've got a recording folder set up here. So I'm just going to click on that and click Save and hit OK. And now what we're going to do is click on the Record button down here to start recording our production. And we can do kind of what I do when I'm shooting one of my videos. I can say, hey, it's Lon. How you doing? Today we're looking at this computer here. Doesn't it look great? And we can start going through our intro to the video and everything else. And I can switch between the camera views here as we go. And when I'm satisfied with this take, I click the Record button again to stop recording. Now, of course, I have a keyboard shortcut set up for this, but you get the idea as to how it works. And now we've got a recording on the hard drive. So let's take a look and see what's in that record folder now. And you can see the uh, recording that we just made. It's only 23 seconds long, but about 383 megabytes in size. And again, that's because we're using the lossless format. You're going to have huge files, but they'll be the best quality. So if you do want a smaller file, you can revert to MPEG-4, for example. If I've got a super long thing that I'm doing, I might use that. But generally, again, I stick to the lossless just to have the best uh, file going into my edit workflow. Now, what I like to look at after recording is the logs folder that will be created in your record folder. And what I do is I go into the log for the video file that I just recorded and make sure that I don't have any drop frames. What's nice is that for every recording, you get all of this data spit back out at you. So you can see if there was any audio dropouts. You can see if you've had any dropped frames. And it's a great way to troubleshoot things. 
If your system is not showing a lot of utilization in the course of your production, you shouldn't see any drop frames at all. If you do, it's likely that your disk is having a hard time keeping up with the recording. And I found in my experience that using a fast solid state drive or an NVMe solid state drive on my desktop like I'm using now uh, is the best way to go just to ensure that you can get these recordings on your disk exactly as you shot them. And I found over time that if you've got a fast drive, you'd never have any drop frames issues provided your resource utilization is well under a 85% utilization, for example. So just keep an eye on that. And I think once you get going and build some confidence in the hardware that you're using, you won't have to go back and check it too often. Now, because I'm recording live to disk and I like to essentially edit while I'm recording, I always like to review whatever I just shot before I move on to the next clip. And this helps with continuity, but also making sure that I don't have to go back and do more later. So what I like to do is add something called a list to my production. And this is not something that actually gets brought into the production, but it's there for me to review things quickly so I can move on to the next item. And list is up here towards the top. And what I'm gonna do is just click OK. And when I do that, you'll see I have this blank box here. Now, if I right click on it and go to edit items, uh, you will see a dialog box pop up here. You might see it pinned to the side of the screen here also, but either way it works the same and you can always de-pin it so you have it as a separate window. And what I'm gonna do here is click on add, and then I'm gonna go to one of the clips that I just recorded. I typically like to have this uh, selected as a list here ordered by date, so I can always go to the clip that I most recently shot. And if this is my intro, what I usually do is rename it right here in the uh, dialog box before I drop it into my list to make sure it's good. So I'll look at it there, I'm thinking it's good. So I'll click intro there and pop it in. And then I can just play it back. Now the problem here is that I'm not hearing it. And the reason is, is that I muted audio. And the reason I muted audio is for this reason, because I'm echoing back. So what I wanna do is not interrupt my workflow here. So I go over to my uh, audio settings for this input by clicking the gear icon again. And this time I'm going to go over to the audio settings button here and you'll see a headphone icon here. I'm just gonna click on the headphone here to mute it. And so now if I close that out and close this out and unmute my audio, um, we're not gonna hear me echoing back at all now because we have muted the output, but the output is still going into my production if that makes sense. We basically muted us for headphones only uh, but the audio is still available for my production and recordings. And the cool thing about this is that if I enable audio on the list here and take it into my program, I can say, hey, it's Lon, how you doing today? So now I'm able to hear what I want to hear and not hear what I don't want to hear. And I did that again just by clicking on the setting here, going to audio, and turning off headphones for my camera audio, but leaving it enabled on this list. So what I do is play this back, make sure I'm happy with how everything is looking. If it is, then I set myself up for the next shot and keep recording. And if you're curious as to what this list looks like while I'm in the midst of production, here you go. This is what we're doing right now. And as you can see, we've got about 14 clips so far. And then I leave notes for myself or for Jake who helps me with editing here, uh, because if I screw up on one of the clips, we'll cut it at a certain spot and then I'll pick it up on the next clip. And again, all of this cuts down editing time. And even though it requires a little bit more time while you're shooting, you save a lot more time in the end because everything is always top of mind when I'm sitting here recording as opposed to looking at it in the edit bay uh, two or three days later. So that is the basic workflow here. We've got a multi-camera system going on right now. We've got a means of recording. And if you wanna add more cameras, just add a few more cameras and you're good to go. Not much more to do here for the basics, but vMix can do a lot more. And what I'd like to do next is show you some of the compositing features, because if you ever watch my weekly wrap-up video, we have a little looping background going, we've got an overlay from my computer, and we have me on screen. And that's one of the most powerful things about vMix is its ability to very efficiently composite multiple inputs together into a single output. Let's have a look at that. So on the laptop right now, I've got a folder here called backgrounds. And inside that folder, I've got a couple of looping backgrounds. This is the lighter of the two. And this one here is a little bit darker. And what we're gonna do is pull up our vMix system here again. 
and I'm going to add an input because that's what you do in vMix. You add things as inputs. And what we'll do is select the video option here up top. I'll go to Browse, and I'm going to select the lighter of the two. I'll click OK, and I'll click OK again. And there you go. We've now got a looping background that if I take live will become just a looping background. And if I click on the loop button here, it will continuously play. So if we get to the end of the playback here, it will just loop back to the beginning. Pretty cool. All right, so we got this looping background going right now. Nothing exciting. And again, this is what the viewer is seeing, just the background, because everything in this box is what is being recorded or streamed out or both. So what we want to do is add another input, which is going to consist of components of the other inputs we have already configured. So I'm going to go over here and just select color. And by default, it's just a black box. And now we've got just a black box. But what I'm going to do is click on the gear icon here. And one of the cool things about vMix is that they have a feature called multi-view. And if I select multi-view and I select for number one here, I uh, will pick my, uh, my cam link camera here. There I am. Uh, I've got that. And now I'm going to put the background on here as well. And boom, it goes on top of me. Because basically, this starts as the bottom layer, and then everything else after it goes on top. So let's say I don't want this background, of course, taking over the image. Uh, what I can do is click on that position button that I just clicked on, and I can move it over like this and get it into a good spot there. And then what I can also do is go back to overlay one, which is me, and move that over a little bit like that. And now I've got a little composite here. And let me go back to our other screen here. And if I cut this in, this is what the viewer would see right now, kind of similar to my weekly wrap-up videos that I do, but it's missing something, which is the output of my computer screen. Now we're going to bring the video from our computer over to the laptop here using a technology called NDI. It is basically magic because what it lets you do is take video and put it on your network, and then anything else that's on the same network can grab it and integrate it into its production. Depending on the NDI technology that your devices are using, this can be a lossless video signal with very low latency, and it's almost as good as just plugging in directly. There's a bunch of different ways to get NDI over to your system. You could use something like this box here from NewTek. This is called a Connect Spark. Other manufacturers also make devices like this. And basically what you do is you plug your computer or your camera or whatever else you want to use into the input here. And then it just spits the video out onto the network via Ethernet or in this case over Wi-Fi. But of course for the best results you definitely want to use Ethernet both on your NDI sending devices and on the computers that you're using to receive it. Now one of the cool things though is that NDI from a computer can be done via software and not hardware. And there's a free utility that vMix offers called Desktop Capture that I found to work very well. And another thing I will suggest to you is to go over to the NewTek website and download their NDI tools because they have an NDI viewer and a bunch of other stuff that might be helpful for monitoring your productions over the network. And I'll refer you to my NDI video to get all the details about that. But this is just a groundbreaking technology that has made my life so much easier. And what I've got running right now on my Mac is the uh, NDI Capture app from vMix, which I found to work a little better than Nutex. And what I'm going to do here is go back to our production, and we're going to add the Mac into the mix here. So right now I've got my Mac running with Keynote, just like I've got when I'm doing the weekly wrap-up. And I'm going to click on NDI. And you're going to see a whole bunch of stuff pop up here because I am using NDI quite a bit these days. And as you can see here, I've got my MacBook Air coming in. And it's got all the different windows that are currently up that I can bring in individually. But this one called Display 1 is what's on my screen right now as a full screen item. So this will basically give me the entire uh, display of that Mac. I'm going to click OK. And now we've got a new input here, which is my slideshow. Pretty cool. So you can see the cross dissolves are all working. And again, this is coming in right over the network, nothing fancy. But I want to integrate this into my composite that I'm building here. So I'm going to click on that gear icon again. And what we'll do is zoom in a little bit so we can get a better view of what we're looking at. And we're going to go over back to multi-view. And I'm going to add this as a third item because you can see now that it's showing up here as one of the things that I can select. Boom. 
Now, we got a problem because it's too big. So I can go back to position and I can zoom this down a bit and then I can position it over here and it's kind of overtaking my head still so I'll zoom it out a little bit more and then I can get it all adjusted and maybe adjust myself to better fit. But you get the idea as to how this works. So now we've got three things on the same screen. We've got our computer output here. We've got the looping background and my camera all working on a single virtual input. And this works like any other input here. So if I pull up my uh, webcam now and switch to that, you can see that the uh, multi-view here went into preview mode and I can put it back up full screen if I want. And then you can do some cool stuff here too. So that merge button that we talked about before, uh, I'll switch over here to our full screen. If I click merge, watch what happens. It'll do a little animation to move that computer image to full screen. Isn't that neat? Um, so you've got a lot of cool stuff that you can do with these composites. And what I love about vMix is that it's treating this just like any other input and I can switch to it uh, just like any other input. Really neat stuff. So now let's take a look at a few more things related to the NDI feature because on vMix, NDI is a two-way street and it's really integrated quite well. Let's take a look at that. Now you saw how easy it is to bring in the NDI inputs here. You just select that from your input list and pick the NDI source that you want to use. Now if you want to send NDI out on the network, you can do that through the external section down here. You want to click on this gear icon and go to output NDI settings. And as you can see right now, I've got NDI on on one of my output options here. And right now it is set to output. So option one here is to send the program out over the network over NDI. And you can see that it is green, which means it is outputting right now. Uh, but I could also just put another thing out there. So let's say I just wanted to have my uh, webcam view appear on NDI. I can set that as input two and turn NDI on and I'll click OK. And now those are being made available to my network. So I'm going to now switch to the much more complicated screen of what I'm currently working on here. And if I go over to add input and go to NDI, I can then see our vMix output here and you can see uh, this is vMix output one and this is vMix output two. So let's bring in output two, which is the webcam and we'll pull that up here on screen. There you go. Now this is coming in from this over NDI to my production system here and you can see it looks perfect, doesn't it? Uh, and then what I could do is maybe uh, add in another NDI input from the laptop here. So I'll go to add input again and we'll select NDI and we'll go back to the laptop and this time we're going to select its program output. So I'm going to pull that up on screen and before I start sending stuff out, I'm going to switch back to our uh, composite here, which is me and the computer graphic and everything else. And now if I go back to my system, uh, you will see that this is now available to me. I can click on that and I can take it live. We got some audio delay because of how this is all configured, but you get the idea. It is very easy to grab what's coming out of here and put it on your network so that you can look at it on a computer screen or on a monitor or anything else that supports NDI and you can send it in and out at the same time. Now typically NDI can consume a lot of bandwidth on your network. Let's take a look at what this thing is currently using to get this video sent and received. All right, so right now on the network, this machine, the laptop here, is transmitting about 275 megabits per second and that is three 1080p feeds running at 30 frames per second over NDI back to my production machine. So we have the two outputs from vMix that we just set up, and then I'm also sending the entire display of this laptop over NDI as well. And the amount of bitrate you need will vary based on how much motion is going on in the video. It'll also depend on what resolution you're running at. So if we were at 1080p 60, that would use a little bit more bandwidth. If we were doing 4K 60, that would eat up even more. But I think for most 1080p productions running at 30 frames per second, gigabit is probably going to be just fine. We still have plenty of room for additional NDI feeds if we wanted to. Now check out the receive here because remember we are sending the output of my Mac for that composite over NDI into the laptop. So we've got three going out and one going in. And if I progress the slide here on the Mac, watch what happens to the receive. Let me move the mouse out of the way here. You see how that just jumped up to like 40 megabits per second? I'll do it again. 
And that's because there was a lot of motion suddenly coming over the feed. So NDI is very efficient about not using bandwidth it doesn't need. Uh, but when you start adding more motion to the mix, you'll see that uh, bandwidth increase to accommodate uh, whatever information is coming through on that video. Pretty neat stuff. And again, NDI is a really nice feature of this. And think about how this might work on a high school campus where you've got network drops all over the place. You could plug in a camera and have a remote session going anywhere that you can get either a Wi-Fi signal or a direct Ethernet connection. Now, if you are going to try to do NDI over Wi-Fi, you should not use the regular NDI protocol. You want to look for something called NDIHX on the devices that you're looking at. And this box from NewTek is the Connect Spark. I've got a couple of these. And this will compress the video down to a much lower bit rate. So I think this one maxes out at around 14 or 15 megabits per second at its highest quality but it's going to losslessly compress the video, similarly to H.264. I think that's the base encoding that it's using. So it will work over Wi-Fi, but not always reliably based on distance and interference and everything else. So no matter what you're doing, I think it's best to use Ethernet whenever possible. But if you have a, a pretty uh, low-trafficked Wi-Fi network, you might be able to get away with Wi-Fi using one of these HX devices. So you can see how useful NDI can be on a laptop like this to supplement the limitations of only having USB as a direct capture method. And again, the NDI video is just as good as wired video most of the time, provided your network conditions are good. And right now we've got two sources coming over the USB now into our laptop, along with two 1080p NDI sources here. All is working well. Uh, we're recording at the same time here with that lossless codec, and we're maybe using about 25 to 30 percent of our overall system resources, but we still have plenty of headroom here on this laptop, and I think that's pretty awesome. Now, at the same time we're doing all of this, we can also stream it out, and to configure streaming, you go over to the stream section here and click on the gear icon to get started. Uh, you can stream to just about any service out there that supports RTMP, and you can send out three streams simultaneously. There's also other services that are supported directly, like YouTube and Facebook and many CDN providers out there as well. But you should have pretty much universal compatibility provided your uh, provider works with RTMP. You've got a bunch of presets here for the different bit rate and encodings that you might want to use. And I would always suggest turning on the hardware encoder to make sure that your NVIDIA encoder is doing the work versus the CPU to keep those resources down. We haven't talked about titling yet, and they've got some great stuff built in for that. So if you click on the Add Input button and then go over to Titles, you'll have a bunch of different ones to choose from. Uh, which titles you have available to you will vary based on which edition of vMix you choose, and we'll talk about the editions in a minute. Uh, but I'm just going to pick this basic one here and click OK. And as you can see, I've got a headline. I'll just type my name in here. And I'll go over to Description Test and say, very tired. This, this shoot's been taking a while. And I'll go ahead and close out this window. And now I could take this live, but of course, it's just showing up on a black background. That's not what I want. What I want to happen is have that title appear over this video. And what you'll notice on the bottom of each of these inputs are these numbers one through four, and these are your overlay layers. So for example, if I go over to our title here and click on one, you will see that appear over the video here. And if I click it again, it will disappear. Now this edition of vMix supports four of these overlays, so I could add another one. So we'll go back here to titling, and they've got this cool little bug that I can put up in the upper right-hand corner. So I will just let it be that on the default. And then if I hit two, isn't that neat? Now, if I hit one here, it would replace the title uh, with the spinner here. So you get uh, four different ones that you can run simultaneously. So I can put this one in one, hit two here. I've got the bug and the title going at the same time. Good stuff. All right, I've got one more feature left to show you, and that is vMix Call, because this is another thing that I use pretty extensively with my vMix installation. 
Now what vMix Call lets you do is bring in remote guests and have them appear inside of your production system just like any other video input no matter where they are in the world. It is amazing. I have done a bunch of interviews with it over the last year and I've been very, very happy with it. Uh, so what you do here is just go to Add Input and then you go over to Video Call and what you'll get is a special URL that you can pass along to your guest. Now they should be running with the Chrome browser if they're on a desktop computer or a laptop or an Android phone, but it also works on the iPhone's Safari browser. And what it does is it basically brings in their webcam and microphone directly into vMix. And the video quality is amazing if they have a good internet connection. Uh, you can see some of the interviews that I did before. I've got one here that I did as a fun test with a couple of buddies of mine when I was first playing around with this feature. And as you can see, it looks great. And you can bring in people in multiple boxes doing some of the compositing that we were doing earlier. And what's really cool is that they can talk to each other without hearing any looping feedback or echoes. It just handles all the back-end audio masterfully. And it's a lot easier to work with than Skype, for example. So if you're looking to do interviews, vMix is really well suited for that. And another thing you could do is run vMix on a cloud server like the shadow thing that we reviewed a few weeks ago and have everybody call in via vMix call and run your production that way as well. There's just so much you can do with it and it works exceptionally well and I've been very, very happy with it. Now when I am done with my recordings, I load them into the vMix video converter here, which will convert those lossless AVI files to ProRes files for my Mac to edit. I don't lose any quality with this and my Mac will not have to transcode anything when I bring it over. It does take a little bit of time to get that conversion done, but usually I'm done shooting. I set the thing to convert and I get up and get a cup of coffee or something and then come back uh, when it's concluded with that conversion process. And then I've got files that I can edit very easily on my Mac and it all works out pretty well. And once you set up a really complicated production, you can save it and then just jump back to it whenever you need to. So I've got a bunch of presets on my system and now I've got uh, what we just set up earlier here saved. So I can just double click on here, it will launch vMix. And after a second or two, it will get our USB cameras brought in. It's gonna find all those NDI sources that we had configured before. The title is right where we left it. There's the last NDI, the Mac is here, and we're pretty much right where we left off. Now there are a couple of editions of vMix available, actually more than a couple. Uh, so you should take a look at their comparison table and go through what your options are. Uh, what I'm gonna be sending over to the school is the $350 HD version, uh, which will allow for 1,000 total inputs, but of course the number of inputs that you can use are going to be limited by the hardware you're using. And it also allows for four overlay channels, so we can have uh, a title and three other things going simultaneously. Now if you wanted to go up to 4K, uh, there's a $700 version that basically gives you the same capability at a higher resolution. You have an additional recording slot so you can record two different video outputs at the same time. And then on the bottom here, you're gonna notice the number of vMix calls that it supports. And the HD version, which the school is getting, supports one caller, but the 4K version, which is the one I use here on the channel, supports four. And if you go up to the maximum edition here, you can get a total of eight callers brought into it. But take a look here at the list and see what works best for you. A lot of folks are very happy with basic HD and starting out with that and then upgrading as they go. What's nice is that you can use whatever you have spent on the edition you have uh, against what you're purchasing up to. So for example, if you were to upgrade from HD to 4K, uh, you'll get your purchase price of HD knocked off the price of 4K. They'll just convert the license over and upgrade it. Now when you purchase a vMix license, you get a year's worth of upgrades. And then after that, you pay $60 a year to keep the upgrades coming. And that includes version updates. I was really surprised that they don't charge you for a new version, at least at the time I'm recording this video. So overall, I've been very, very happy with uh, the performance and the stability. Now my desktop computer that's currently running this production is an i9-9900K based machine. I've got 32 gigs of RAM, but only a GTX 1080 GPU that I had pulled out of my gaming machine when I upgraded it. And it's been working great at 1080p 30. I'm gonna try to go to 4K at some point in the future, 4K 30, and I'm pretty sure we will be okay with that. But at some point I might upgrade the GPU just to get a little bit more horsepower if I'm gonna start driving multiple 4K sources in beyond my cameras. 
I do have a Blackmagic card in the desktop computer here for video input. It has four HDMI inputs on it. It is rock solid, flawless, never drops a frame, and I've been really happy uh, using that versus NDI for everything. So I think whenever you can, try to wire in your most important cameras, but you can definitely get away with NDI on all the other stuff, and I'm using both uh, here in the studio to do everything uh, that you see here on the channel, both recorded and streamed out. So I think I've covered kind of the basics of what I'm using vMix for. There is a lot more to this, I mean like a lot more, so much that we could start a whole new channel on it. It does great green screening if you're wondering about that. You saw some of the other things that it's able to do. It's got great automation built in as well. Uh, so let me know what you'd like to see more of and I will try to deliver uh, as we get through the next couple of months here. So uh, let me know down in the comments. Uh, you can download vMix for free and use it I think for 60 or 90 days. They've got a great trial and the trial edition is full featured so you get the most expensive version as the trial. No watermarks or anything else like that. You play around with it, you pick the license you want and then you can keep uh, going with it. So I'm very eager to get this over to the school and see what the kids can do with it. A very flexible system as you can see with a lot more to talk about which we'll try to get to in future editions here. Uh, but overall I'm a very happy vMix customer and I found that sometimes when things make your life easier it's worth paying for those things which I have done here. That's going to do it for now. Until next time this is Lon Sivan. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker. Jim Peter, Tom Albrecht, Frank Lewandowski, Mark Bollinger, and Chris Allegretta. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.